Hello again, as you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today we're going to be talking about Hyper-V failover. So what we're going to be doing is uh, I have set up two servers so that if one server fails, one Hyper-V server fails, then you can start up the virtual machines on a different Hyper-V server very easily. So the idea is you have two Hyper-V servers. So Hyper-V is the virtualization software. Then you install the instances of operating systems onto that, right? So the question is, is what happens if a power supply fails? What happens if a CPU fails? One, one of those types of things. That's why you have failover. So basically you have two Hyper-V servers, they're synchronizing the data, and if one server physically fails for some reason, you can bring up the virtual machines on the other uh, server, lickety-split, uh, very easily and keep uh, going on with business, having a business continuity. Now it's very important that you understand a few things uh, when I'm going to be talking about this today. So again, one of the things you have to understand whenever I'm going to be talking about technology, a lot of times I talk about high level theory. I don't talk about the specific uh, operating system a lot. So depending on what Hyper-V version you're using and server version you're using, this may be a little bit different. So I'm kind of explaining how this works. Uh, if you are going to be setting this up and especially trying to use it in a production environment, make sure you do the Google searches and you know exactly what's going on. What I am showing you guys today, I'm using the Hyper, uh, the current Hyper-V uh, on Windows 2012 R2. So that is what I am using today. And if you go, you can download a trial version of Windows Server uh, 2012 R2 and do everything that I, I am doing today. Now, the big thing that you have to understand uh, whenever you're dealing with Microsoft Hyper-V is the thing that Microsoft is scared, the, the most worried about is something called split brain. Split brain and this is something that you have to be very worried about because split brain can be absolutely and utterly devastating to your environment. Devastating. Devastating to your environment, especially if you're dealing with a large environment. So be very careful about split brain. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about split brain? So we set up this replication, this Hyper-V replication. So when we're doing Hyper-V replication, what is happening is we are making ideas identical functional copies of these servers. It is not going into a backup file that we then have to restore. We are literally having two clones of uh, this instance sitting on your infrastructure. Well, how Hyper-V works is if you have two Hyper-V servers and they can see each other, you, have, you may have that clone, but you are not able to actually start the clone. You get an error, right? So you have hyper, you have a, an instance on this Hyper-V server, let's say Ubuntu. So I've got a couple of servers I'll show you in a second. But let's say on this server, you have the in instance of Ubuntu, and it's replicated over to this other server. So on the first server, Ubuntu is running. Well, on the second server where it's been replicated to, if you try to start the Ubuntu server, it will fail out because that second Hyper-V server can see that Ubuntu is already running on the first server, and therefore it goes, this is a clone, and we sure as hell don't want clones running on the same network, especially once you start getting into using like Windows servers. So you're talking about Active Directory servers and database servers, you can run into all kinds of problems because these clones have the exact same IP address. They have the exact same security policies. They have the exact same everything. So if you have the, if you have both clones running at the exact same time, the issue is, is especially with routing and how information gets sent through your infrastructure, some data may go to this server, some data may get go to this server, some data may get pulled from this server, some data may get pulled from this server, and then all of a sudden you have two servers that are providing the exact same services and data is going to one but not the other and to the other but not the one, and all of a sudden it gets really nasty. You know, if you're just thinking about like a file server, that's not horrible. That's recoverable from, you know, if, if you've got split brain on a file server or a web server, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, it, it'll slow things down for a little while, but that's probably recoverable. But if you have a, imagine if you have a database server and you now have two literally identical database servers that you're pumping data into, Active Directory, something like that, the exact same IP addresses, the exact same security policies, the exact same everything. You change a, you change a password and it goes to this Active Directory server. He changes a password and it goes to this Active Directory server. You change your permission on something and it goes to this Active Directory server. They change your permission and now it goes on this Active Directory server. And now your database... You know what I'm saying? It's getting split and gnarled and all horrible. 
So what you have to be very, very, very careful about in the Microsoft world with Hyper-V is do not get split brain. Now you may be sitting there and you may be thinking, well, Eli, how would I get split brain, right? You know, if this server fails, if server one fails, the power supply fails, the CPU fails, whatever, that obviously will crash all the instances on that Hyper-V server. And so I can bring them up on the second Hyper-V server and there's no way you can have split brain. Well, as I've talked about before in troubleshooting classes, is remember that uh, these servers uh, can only talk to each other and only know they exist through networking, right? So this server is connected to your network and this server is connected to the network. All this server knows, the second server knows, is it can now no longer talk to the first server. That may be because the CPU failed, that may be because the hard, drive, uh, the hard drive failed or the power supply failed, or it may be because somebody unplugged the wrong cable in the server cabinet, or it may be because a switch failed, or it may be somebody was screwing around with routing protocols and, and, and mucked something up. Well, think about that. If somebody screws up with your networking, this server may not be able to talk to this server, but can talk to a lot of other client computers on the network. This server may not be able to talk to that server, but it can talk to another lot of other client computers on the network. So if you get a call and you get told that the Hyper-V server, or these, these instances are down, and you try to go in and you try to remote control and you try to remote control this, this first Hyper-V server and you can't get to it because you're on this side of whatever that, that network screw up is. And you go, oh no, Hyper-V server one is down. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the, the, all the instances on the Hyper-V two server. Well, that is now where we have split brain because whatever's going on with that networking, now all those instances, because basically when you try to bring those instances up on the second server, it will try to communicate with the first server. That communication will fail because whatever's going on here with the network layer. Uh, so it'll say, okay, I'm able to do that. It will then bring those servers up. These servers are now providing services for all these clients. These servers are doing all the, the things for these clients. And now what happens when the routing is fixed, you now have I, what were identical servers that now have different information in them. <laughs> That's got to be horrible. I can't even explain. Like I say, a lot of you noobs, I know a lot of you noobs are just sitting there like, oh, that's not that bad. <laughs> Oh my God, can you imagine that? Can you can you imagine that in like an environment of a thousand people? That would be horrible. I can't even explain to you guys how horrible that would be. So what I'm saying, when we start talking about um, Hyper-V replication and failover, be careful of split brain. Look at me when I'm laughing. <laughs> Look at me, look at my face right now and understand exactly how much pain you would be in if this happens. So if you want to start doing a Hyper-V failover, it's actually relatively easy to do. Um, that's one of the things I, I like about the Microsoft world. Again, I like Server 2012. As much as I can complain about Windows 8, Server 2012 is actually very nice. So if you're going to be setting all this up it, it, for Hyper-V replication, it's actually rather easy. Uh, on both servers that you're going to be replicating, uh, you have to install Hyper-V obviously. Then on both of those servers, on the host operating system, you set up replication. So basically you say, this Hyper-V server is allowed to replicate, and you say, this Hyper-V server is allowed to replicate. Then within the individual instances, you set up the replication for those individual instances. So you may or may not what individual instances to be able to replicate. So that's what I've shown you, uh, what I have set up today, is I have two uh, instances that are able to replicate, and then one instance that's not allowed to replicate. Okay. Why would you do that? I don't know. That goes to art and science. You know what I'm saying? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you want to do something. You've got to figure all that out. So let's go over to the computer right now so I can kind of show you what's going on. And like I say, this is, this actually is really, really, really cool. As long as long as you don't get split brain. I know a lot of you, a lot of times, you know, I say things and you guys get irritated with how often I say them. You're like, yeah, Eli, I get the point. I will bang this one into your head. If you get split brain, in any kind of decent sized environment, I cannot explain to you how horrible that would be. I, I can't even like, I, I, yeah. So anyways, let's go over to the computer and I can kind of show you what's going on. 
Oops, nope, that's not my computer. Let's go to the computer. There we go. There we go. So this is the computer. So right now I am using a remote desktop and we're looking at my two 2012 servers. So I have these 2012 servers set up on different physical boxes and on them I have Hyper-V installed. So we can see the Hyper-V manager, if you guys, guys can see. So this is server 192.168.1.3 and this is server 192.168.1.2. So the way that I've set this up is the 192.168.1.2 Two. This is the main server, so this has my main instances. So we can see Fedora, Server 2012, and Ubuntu. And then what I'm doing is I'm using the second server, 192.168.1.3, just as that failover server for right now, just Fedora and just Server 2012. So that's an important thing to understand. You don't have to replicate all your servers if you don't want to. Uh, you can only replicate, you can, you can just replicate one or, or you know, multiple or whatever. So the first thing that you need to do in order to start doing replication is you need to go over here and you need to select your host. So these are instances. This is the host. So the host is this physical box, this server 2012 box. And here we need to go into settings. So we go to Hyper-V settings and we need to go down and we need to do replication configuration. So replication configuration is what allows you to do replication. If you don't set up replication, you can't do replication. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, then you go in here and you do enable this computer as a replica server. And then it's going to ask you the authentication. So I would say use, how the hell do you say this? Kerberos? Ker Kerber oh, you guys understand. K-E-R-B-E-R-O-S. So if you use this, this is kind of like the standard security for Windows servers. In order to make this work, this has to be part of a domain. So I actually, I do have to say, when I set this up, I have an Active Directory Domain Controller DNS and DHCP. And so in order to do this, uh, that was the easiest way. So basically, in order for this to communicate with the other server, they need to use a security an authentication style. And so if you have a domain set up, that makes your life a lot easier. You can do certificate-based authentication. Um, and I looked into that, and that's a complete pain in the ass. Uh, so you can do that. You can, in fact, do that. Um, maybe I will do a class on that later. But I am telling you, it's a hell of a lot easier just to do this within a domain. So you set up your Active Directory domain. You set up your Hyper-V. And then you come in here. You do enable this computer as a replicate server. You use Karibos. Uh, then you go down here, uh, authorization and storage, allow allow a replication from any authenticated server or allow replication from the specified servers. So you have to decide, I would just do, you know, in this kind of testing phase, just from any authenticated server. And then of course you click OK. You then have to make sure you go over to the other server that you're going to be using for failover and replication. You go over to Hyper-V settings and you set up the exact same thing. Re replication configuration, enable this, Karibros, however you say it, allow replication from any uh, authenticated servers and you do okay. So the one thing you do have to remember is for this replication, you have to set that up. If you don't set that up, it's not going to work and you're going to run into problems. So then past that, what you have to do is you have to do, you go in and you actually set up the replication uh, for the uh, the server. So as we can see, I have an instance of Fedora here that's getting replicated in server 2012. So all we have to do is we go down, and so for Ubuntu, if we say, okay, I now want to replicate uh, Ubuntu. So what I do is I right click here, I can go down and I can do enable replication. I click on enable replication, and then we just go through this process. Next, so what do I want to uh, Replicate to, this is my server, server2.etcg.local, I hit next. It verifies a uh, replica server, replica port, use this authentication. Do I want to compress the data that is being transmitted over the network? Um, that's a checkbox. I'm not really sure why you wouldn't. Uh, that may be something if you're in a real production environment you want to take a look at. As far as I'm concerned, you would always leave that checked. But, you know, they give you the option, so maybe there's a reason you want to do it. Virtual hard disks that you want to deal with, and you click Next. Uh, then the question comes to how frequently do you want the data replicated? Again, this is one of those really important things to be thinking about. Because the more often the data gets replicated, that means the more bandwidth you are going to use. This may or may not matter in your environment. If everything's connected to a gigabit per second switch and you're not using much bandwidth, then it's fine. Uh, if you have a congested network already, that may, be, may, may suck. So basically, it's either 30 seconds, 5 minutes, or 15 minutes. So the first thing you have to think about is how much do you care about 
uh, with your bandwidth. If you don't care about your bandwidth, I would say just synchronize it every 30 seconds. The other thing to realize though, and this is an important thing to realize, is this is, again, this is not real-time replication. Even if you set this down to 30 seconds, it replicates every 30 seconds, that still means there's a 30 second gap uh, when every kind of, uh, when the replication happens. So there's a 30 second gap where if one of the, the if the Hyper-V server fails, and then you bring uh, the instance up on a different Hyper-V server, there will be 30 seconds of information missing. Why that's important for you guys to understand is, again, if you're dealing with a, a file server, uh, it doesn't really matter. If you're dealing with a read-only, read-only, no write, read-only domain control, it probably doesn't matter. But if this is, again, a database server where information is being written to it, 30 seconds of downtime, 30 seconds of failed writes may be very important. Again, that's one of those art, science, the whole nine yards, figure it out, just think about it. That is one thing you may want to look for with a different um, uh, virtualization uh, solution is if you need real-time uh, virtualization. But anyway, it's got 30 seconds here, and then we click on next. Uh, maintain only the latest recovery point or create hourly recovery points. You can actually create different uh, recovery points uh, if you need that for some reason. I'll just leave that. Maintain only the, the latest. Hit next. Uh, send the initial copy over the network. So depending on how large your initial copy is, right? Is this a server? This server is like, I don't know, 5 gigs or something so it doesn't really matter. But is your server about four terabytes? Again, do you want to pump that entire darn thing over the network, or do you want to export it to some kind of external hard drive and manually move it? That's important. Imagine, because you can do this Hyper-V replication between different sites. So if I have a main headquarters office uh, and a remote site, let's say the remote site, I have my Hyper-V servers running, and I replicate them back to the headquarters office. Well, um, basically, do I want that initial replication to go all the way through the, the, the ISP connection, my 30 megabit per second internet connection, or do I just want to pick up an external hard drive and actually mail it to the headquarters? That's, that's one of the things you can think about. Uh, start replication immediately or start the replication at a specific time. Again, these are different things that you just have to figure out depending on what you want. Hit next and then hit finish. And so once you've hit finished, uh, replication enabled uh, successfully, so we can go in and we can look at the settings. Um, so we go down here and we've got the replication and we can see the replication, Kribros every 30 seconds, so on and so forth. So right now you can go up here and you can see Ubuntu and it's sending the initial uh, replica and so that's what's happening. So that's so once you've set up your Hyper-V servers in order to do replication, uh, then all you have to do is set up your individual instances and again, it's individual instances. So this is for only for Ubuntu. Server 2012 was set up differently. Fedora was set up differently. So every single instance you have to go in. Once you've done that, uh, you can just highlight whichever uh, instance you want to take a look at. You can go into settings, uh, and then you can just see what the replication strategy is uh, for that particular instance. So I can look at this, and since this is off, since Fedora is off, I can go in here and play with it. So you know, every 30 seconds, do I want to compress the whole nine yards? Do you remember, if you want to make any modifications to the settings of your virtual machines, you do have to turn the virtual machine off. Also for the failover, that I'll show you in a second, you have to, to turn the virtual machine off. So there we go, and we just click. Uh, beyond that, we can go um, and we can take a look at, what we want to look at is the view, the replication health. So this is a very important, right? So we're going to be sending, we're going to be creating exact clones. Well, the plan, <laughs> it's always the plan. It's always the plan, right? What is reality? The plan is to create identical clones. What is the reality, right? Is that replication happening? Is there a problem with firewalls? Is there a problem with antivirus? Is something just screwed up? You want to make sure that the replication, at least the, the Hyper-V servers think the replication is happening. So what you can do is, again, all you do is you right-click whatever instance you care about. You go to replication, and then you do view replication health. So when you click on this, this will then show you the health of the replication. Is it in fact replicated? So I can come down here, replication health is normal, so that I know that the, the, the copy on the other side should be healthy. I can go over here just to verify. I can highlight, I can do replication, I can see view uh, replication health, and again, I can go and make sure it's normal. So if this is if there's gonna be a planned failover, the best thing to do is make sure that 
both copies are, are happy and healthy and there's no other issue. You also see now, since I started the replication uh, with Ubuntu, Ubuntu is now here. So that all happened rather easily. Okay, so now the next thing that we're going to be taking a look at is the whole failover process. So the important thing to understand is you cannot fail over a running machine. So this is not an automatic failover process. You actually have to manually fail over. You have to turn off uh, the, uh, the, the virtual machine on your first Hyper-V server before you can fail it over to the other Hyper-V server. So you'll see here, Fedora, Server 2012, and Ubuntu, the state is all off because those are off. And over here, we can see that Server 2012 and Ubuntu are actually running. So in order to do the failover, what we then have to do is we have to turn off the machine over here. So what I can do is I can right click on this and I can simply do a turn off of Ubuntu and I'm just going to turn it off. Now that it's off, what I can do is I can right click it, I can do replication, and I can do a planned failover. So the planned failover means I know this failover is going to happen and I want to do it. So I just click on the planned failover, then it's going to ask me a couple of questions. Start the replica virtual machine after failover, so I'll say yes, just to show you guys what's going on, and reverse the replication direction after failover. So once the failover is done, do I want the replica to come back? to this Hyper-V server. So I will just click that just to make my life easier. And then I can do failover. So now it's going through and we're getting green, 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 green. Start the replica and it has been started. So now we go over to that second uh, machine and we can now see that Ubuntu has failed over and it is now in fact running over here. So this is the failover process. So you have two identical clones. You fail, this is how you fail over. Then all you have to do um, is we can do the replication and we can do, uh, we can uh, remove a replication, we can pause the replication, view help, uh, so on and so forth. So and what I can also do is I can just take this, I can turn this off, and then I can just uh, fail it back over. Um, plan failover, failover, and now it's going back. So if we go over here, it is now Ubuntu and it is running again. Now, I, these, these are actual servers and these are actual live servers. So I, I, can, uh, I can go over here and I can double click this uh, just to show you and we'll get a window of it. Um, so you do have to be careful. So I, when, when I just right click and turn this thing off, that is not what you should do normally. You should do a normal controlled uh, shutdown of the system. I'm just showing you guys this uh, because it's pretty easy. But that that's really all there is to it. Beyond that, you then can have the unplanned failover. I don't know if it'll give me the option uh, now. But basically, if the other machine has failed, uh, what I can do is I can do an unplanned failover and bring these machines online. Again, if for some reason this server can no longer see the other Hyper-V server, you can do an unplanned failover and bring these machines online. You cannot do it now. The issue is though, is if the other machine, if the other Hyper-V server is not in fact turned off, it is simply some kind of networking error, that is when you get, what do you call it? Yep, that's right. That's when you get split brain and then everything goes to hell uh, very, very, very quickly. But this is just the basic idea behind Hyper-V replication and Hyper-V failover. And uh, and like I say, it's it, it's pretty good and it's pretty nice. And the good thing is this is already built into Server 2012. You know, a lot of people, you know, we talk about, um, you know, which version, which which uh, hypervisor solution should we use? Do we use ESXi? Do we use Hyper-V? Do you use Citrix? And one of the things that always comes up is everybody can complaints about the price of Microsoft. Microsoft is too expensive. I'm not going to argue, whatever. But one of the things you have to be thinking about is if you already bought Server 2012, R2 for whatever reason, right? You already own uh, that license, then you already own this product. If you don't need a very robust failover uh, strategy, you already own this, so you don't really have to spend any more money uh, to make it work, right? So if you buy, uh, at least right now, right now, this second, it may change later, but if you buy Server 2012 R2, you are allowed to, to create two virtual instances of 2012 R2 within Hyper-V. So if you want a really rather inexpensive backup solution or failover solution, you can buy a, a, another physical machine, right? another $1,000 server, 
$1,500 server. Install Windows Server uh, with Hyper-V on that. Again, another $600. And then you can have those two physical servers replicating. If one server fails, you can just bring up the instances on the other and fix the first one. And then once that's fixed, then you can put them back. Kind of get what I'm saying? You don't have to go out and spend $3,000 or $2,000 on ESXi if, if you don't actually need it. So that is something to think about. The more I play with Hyper-V, the more I like it. But again, there are some quirks, and you really do have to be concerned. This whole idea of split brain, I know I've said that about 50 times, but it's really nasty. So in order to make this work, as I've done it today... I would argue the easiest way is just to set up an Active Directory domain. So on the first server, I have Active Directory installed, I have DNS installed, and I have DHCP installed. The reason is, do remember, uh, Active Directory prefers Windows, DNS, and DHCP. Again, you can set up some other DNS and DHCP, but that's its own can of worms for your level. Install Active Directory, install DNS, install DHCP, and then install Hyper-V create the domain, so on and so forth. Go over to the other server, that server number two. Make that a member of the domain that you just created using server one, then install Hyper-V. Once you have done, done, done that, for the host, host, not instances, host on both, ser both servers, enable replication using Kuribros. Uh, then once you have done that, on the first machine, go to your individual instances you want to replicate, uh, right, uh, go to settings, uh, then do the replication, and then do your configurations, um, allow the replication to happen, and then from there you can fail over from one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. So again, it's, it's all pretty easy, all pretty simple, and again, if you guys want to play with this, Windows Server 2012 R2 180-day trial, uh, you can just download it for free and install it whatever you want. Um, the, what I showed you guys today, this test, um, I literally have one laptop with 8 gigs of RAM and an i7 processor uh, running server number one, and I have a crappy old uh, desktop computer with 16 16 gigs of RAM and a solid state drive, that's server number two. Uh, so again, remember, you don't need a lot of resources to, to make this work. You, you, you can spin up like three Ubuntu servers that need very, very few resources just to kind of play around with this. Don't think you need some 64 gig RAM thing in order to make this work. But yeah, and that's about it. Um, again, if you want any more, um, in the description below, I will give you guys more, uh, uh, I'll give you links to more specific instructions about how all this works. I just kind of want to give you the overview here uh, so you have an idea. So there you go. Hyper-V, failover, pretty good thing, as long as you don't do anything stupid. NerdsWeCanFixThat.com. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things, you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system. Nerds We Can Fix That is a computer services franchise system. They have 62 franchises throughout the United States. They can franchise in every state other than Hawaii. They also franchise internationally. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, you should contact them, fill out the information below, or give them a call. Again, as I will say, franchise systems are great for a lot of people, not so good for others always make sure to do your due diligence but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway you might as well contact nerds we can fix that to see what they have to say Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer, what devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analysis, analysis tool. Altero.com, A-L-T-A-R-O.com. If you're dealing with virtualization in a Hyper-V environment, so we're talking about Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2, take a look at Altero.com. They have a number of Hyper-V backup solutions. They have the free version, which will back up up to two VMs for free forever. They also have the unlimited version, starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. 
Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer in the show that are technical in nature, you know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the Spiceworks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at spiceworks.com. Total Seminars, totalsim.com. If you're looking for your A+, plus, your Net+, plus, your Security Plus certification, they have video training, practice tests, exam vouchers, and more. If you are on the CompTIA track and you are looking for study prep material, study guides, that type of thing, take a look at Total Seminars, totalsim.com, T-O-T-A-L-S-E-M.com. Veeam.com, V-E-E-A-M.com. If you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up, they have solutions for ESXi, they have solutions for Hyper-V, and as you guys like, they have free stuff. So if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution, take a look at Veeam.com. AdAccess.com, if you're dealing with Active Directory on a large scale, so you have hundreds of users to add, hundreds of users to disable, so on and so forth, you may want to take a look at AdAccess.com. This is Active Directory management and automation software. So this tries to automate and simplify the Active Directory workflow. So if you are in a large scale Active Directory infrastructure, take a look at AdAccess.com. SchoolyMitchell.com. If you're trying to find better internet or telephone service, or if you're trying to find less expensive internet or telephone service, give Schooly Mitchell a call. Basically what these guys are, these guys are telecom consultants. You call them, you say what you need for yourself or your client, and they figure out the best option. They'll examine your existing services and review your bills to make sure there are no errors. Then they'll keep an eye on your services moving forward so that everything remains optimized. Because Schooly Mitchell is objective and independent, they have no ties to vendors. You know they are always your best interests in mind. The best part is there is no fee for their services. The only cost is a portion of the shared savings over a set period of time. If they don't find savings, there is no cost to you. Schooly Mitchell. So the hands-on review for today is the Bluetooth was an instinct speaker from Reactive. So this company called Reactive sent me their nice little Bluetooth speaker, and I do have to say it is a pretty nice thing. So let's go over to a little demonstration table so I can show you what's going on with it. And I think you guys will probably like it. So, uh, so when you order the instinct, it comes in a nice, nice, pretty little box here. Uh, and this is the speaker. So, uh, so it's nice. Uh, it's all plastic and all that, but one of the, the, the things with it is they actually use a very, very good quality plastic. So it actually, it feels good. So, uh, so yeah, there you go. So basically all this is is a Bluetooth speaker. Uh, if you go over to the side, you can see that you can input audio into it if you want. So it's got the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the stereo, the uh, whatever, the speaker port, if you want to put in uh, uh, sound. And, you know, nice little on-off switch. It's got the, the power recharger, the whole nine yards. So you can plug this into the wall and you can play it, or it has a battery in here that lasts about eight hours. Uh, I do have to say the, the music sound on it is very nice. Uh, it has the, uh, the, the bass or whatever. So I had this on my table here, and it, it vibrated the table uh, a pretty decently when I was playing some different music. Again, I am not a music aficionado, so I don't know if this is the perfect thing out there, but for an Eli the computer guy, it's pretty nice. It's got the little, uh, the, the, uh, the hard buttons up here for, uh, for the volume going up and down, and so on and so forth. So that's basically all there is to the reactive speaker. Um, I have to say it is pretty nice. Like I say, that what I like about it, it is, is it's built well. And one of the things I like uh, being a Bluetooth speaker is that it's actually directional. Uh, so many of the Bluetooth speakers nowadays are omnidirectional, so the sound goes out everywhere, uh, which is a real problem if you just want to put uh, your speaker like up against the wall and be able to listen to it because the, the music kind of gets muffled and all that. So one of the nice things that is uh, uh, directional, so you can put this again up against a wall, up against in a bookshelf, and you don't get any uh, distorted music or any of that. But it's a pretty decent little thing. Now, if you're interested in taking a look at Reactive, uh, all you do, let's go over to the the website, and you can take a look at it here. Uh, so they have a they have a god awful. Oh my god, they have a horrible domain name. Um, th this this is like <laughs> this is a tragic tragic domain name for a good product. It's a good product. Horrible domain name. R E A C T I V V S O U N 
D.com. So it's not reactive as in the entire world. It's not R E A C T I V E sound. It's R E A T I V S O U N D.com. So what I will tell you guys is if you want to learn how to manufacture good uh, Bluetooth speakers, go over and talk to these guys. If you want to find out about buying a domain name, stay the hell away from them. But anyways, if you can get through the domain name, if you don't screw it up, uh, you can come here and you can see it's, it's $99.995 with free shipping, which seems about normal so again I, I have a lot of different speakers logitech jcl all kinds of stuff and i mean it it it, it stacks up to them uh very nicely it compares very nicely so it's good it's got the nice little battery in here it's built well i mean i mean that's you know what i'm saying and it's it's fine and the nice part it doesn't really scuff or anything which is good so uh so I like it. This is the Instinct speaker from Reactive. If you've never heard of Reactive before, uh, they make good products from what I can tell. So go take a look at their website, reactivenoesound.com. And then again, since I'm trying to teach you guys how to do stuff in the real world, never buy a domain name like that. That is like the worst domain name I've ever heard in my life. It's just horrible. It's just like, you're setting yourself up for failure with a domain name like that. But anyways, but they do good speakers. So they, go take a look at them. If you're looking for a Bluetooth speaker, eh, give them a thumbs up. So this question comes from Alex M. I've recently been offered a side job as a web artist and I'm seeing this as an opportunity to start, uh, start building experience. My goal is to one day do this professionally with being able to host the websites myself. Um, I was just wondering if you could recommend any good books that will further uh, break me into the basics of building a website. Um... No, not really. Basically, if you want to go out there and you want to start building websites, the best thing to do is just start learning and see where it takes you. Again, building websites um, is kind of like computers when people talk about it. I want to do computers. I want to build websites. And for us professionals, we kind of just rub our temples and go, you know, that's a little bit bigger than your... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> And that's where you come into like with building websites because the question is is when you start talking about building websites, what does that what does that mean? You know that could mean any number of different things. Do you want to be building websites that are very graphically intensive? So uh, so the actual infrastructure of the site isn't that important, but all of the pictures and the graphics and the movies and the animation that is what really makes it snap. Well, if you're going to be doing things like that, then you want to learn uh, stuff like. Adobe Creative Suite. Again, Adobe Creative Suite um, is far more expensive and far more complicated than 99.9999999% of the population needs. But for that point, 0.0001% of the population that is actually creating incredibly crisp, clear, amazing web content, uh, it's very valuable. So if you want to do things like the graphics, you know, logos and pictures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, you would learn Adobe, and that takes a long time. I, I took an Adobe Photoshop class years ago, and the introductory level was 40 hours. Um, I, I think the, the entire, uh, just for Photoshop, not for Creative Suite, Photoshop. I think I think if you went through uh, the, all the training for it, it's like a hundred hours of training just for Photoshop. So if you like that, then you would go down the the Adobe you know, realm. That's what you would do. Then if you get into it and you're doing the design, you're like, well, I don't really care about graphics. I'll just go to iStock Photo or pay somebody else and you're going to be building the websites. Then there's a whole lot of questions of, of, of what uh, languages do you want to use? And that's all... That's all what you decide. Do you want to focus on JavaScript? Do you want to focus on PHP? Do you want to focus on Ruby? Uh, other stuff, Python. Eh, Python. Um, the, all those questions come up. And really, honestly, the, the best way to answer those questions is to simply start building websites uh, and seeing what you personally need to know. Um, that That's the whole path. Everybody has this idea in the technology world, like they want to learn A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then get the $100,000 a year job. And that's not how it works. You learn A, and then you learn P, 
and then you learn Q, and then you go all the way to Z, and then you go to X, and then somehow you're going to BBB, and you're like, how the hell to BBB? Where is that coming from, right? It's all the, the path to get you to where you're going. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Really what I would say is just go out there, start building as many websites as you can, uh, do Google searches, give your, I would argue, give yourself a budget of a few hundred dollars, uh, two or three hundred dollars, and then what I would do is when you find something new and interesting you want to learn, go to Amazon.com, buy a dummies book or a beginner's book or a visual quick start guide on that particular subject, learn it, see if you want to continue doing that or if you want to go over to something else uh, and figure it out what it is. You know, that, 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 is that is the best way to do it is just... That's one problem I see a lot, too, is people will do things like they say, I want to learn PHP. And then around here in like the Baltimore area and a lot of other areas, Ruby on Rails developers are the most valuable. So you spend all this effort learning PHP or whatever else, uh, but then all the jobs are in Ruby. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Whereas if you just flow, maybe your area, you need PHP developers or JavaScript developers or something else. That would be my thought. Don't really worry about the specific books. But just follow your little squiggly ass path and you'll figure it out. Give yourself a few hundred bucks in a year and you'll figure it out. So this question comes from Benjamin. Uh, so he's going through here and he's talking about uh, that he started to play around with virtual private servers. So quick, quick question. Is it necessary to have a browser loaded on a virtual ses uh, server? If so, how is it done? Um, depends on what you're using the virtual server for. Remember, virtual servers are servers. So if you are using your virtual server as just an FTP file server, then you don't need a browser on it. Um, you know, again, whenever you're dealing with servers, it all depends on what the hell you're doing. <laughs> Do you need a browser? No, you don't need a browser. Um, could it be useful, especially if you're using like a Windows virtual server? Uh, it would probably be useful. So do you need one? No. Um, but, you know, you can also do it. Uh, if you do want one on there, how do you install it? Uh, if you're using Windows, so you're using a Windows virtual server, uh, it, it'll have Internet Explorer actually already installed. Right, so uh, so if you're using a Windows uh, server to have uh, Internet Explorer already installed. Um, if you are using Linux and you you want to use a graphical user interface, uh, I would have to do a class on that. I'm not exactly sure how that would work. But if you're using Windows as a virtual pr private server, uh, they definitely have Internet Explorer already installed, uh, and you should be able to use Internet Explorer to go and download and install Google Chrome and go from there if that's really what you want to do. Uh, secondly, I can't seem to accomplish uploading programs such as Office 2003 to my server, um, so on and so forth. That is one thing that actually comes up a lot with virtual private servers. It's one of those things you don't think about until you're sitting there with your thumb drive and you're like <clears throat> how do you plug this into the cloud right because this is, this is something to think about so normally when we're thinking about servers uh we have we have them somewhere local they may be in our, our server room or our data center or sitting right beside us but they're there uh so when we when we uh spin up a server, you know, you can take a USB drive or connect it to your, to your local network and be able to move files around rather easily. The problem happens in the virtual server world, uh, or the, 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 you know, if you're renting a server, is you just spun up that server up in the cloud. And the question is, is okay, you have this file, and, you know, it's executable, and you have to get it from you up there so that you can run it. What the hell do you do? Uh, so generally what you have to do is you have to install or set up the FTP server. So you guys are used to using FTP clients, you know, Qt FTP or FileZilla or something like this. When you're dealing with a server, a VPS server or a dedicated server, many times you'll actually have to set up an FTP server component on it. And then what you can do is from your computer, you can upload your files to the FTP server, uh, and then you can you can run it from there, right? So, you, so on your Linux box, you install a FTP daemon. Um, I like VS FTPD. It's just what I use, but there's a lot of other FTP servers. You basically, you, you install the FTP server. Uh, you just sudo, do sudo apt get, you know, whatever, get it, uh, and install it. Uh, and then you configure it, and then you can connect and be able to upload your files. Uh, if you're doing a Windows server, it's a little bit different. Uh, IIS, I guess, has an FTP component. 
bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, I actually like FileZilla server. So if I'm using uh, Windows, uh, whether it's a desktop computer or a server, and I always want to use it as an FTP server, FileZilla server is very easy to use. So what you can do is you can use Internet Explorer or Chrome or whatever browser you install. You can go to FileZilla.com or .org or whatever it is, download the FileZilla server, install the FileZilla server, configure the FileZilla server, use your client computer to connect to there, and away you go. So th those are the thoughts. So if you're dealing with a Windows server, uh, Internet Explorer should already be installed on it, and you can install a browser if you want to, or don't, if you don't want to. If you're dealing with a Linux server, again, I've never... I hate to say this. Am I allowed to say I've never done something? Um, I haven't. I haven't uh, remotely connected to a graphical Linux machine, a server at least. Uh, whenever I do servers, they're all command line, so I just use SSH. So I would have to figure that one out. So that's its own mess. Uh, but beyond that, and again, if you want to upload the files, just use a, a, a FTP server. Install the FTP server, and away you go. So the final thoughts for today are to make sure that you are prepared to ask for help. So this is one of those things a lot of people don't think about enough, and it is a very important thing in the real world. So the, what we are, what gets pounded into our head uh, so often is that we need to ask help. The idea that we cannot do anything alone, you can never be successful alone, you have to go out there and you have to kind of find other people to help you. But one of the things that never gets brought up is the question of, have you prepared to actually accept the help? And that's one of the issues. Uh, that comes up a lot of times, especially with new people. So what I ran into very recently is I had a fellow YouTuber who reached out to me to see about doing cross promotion, right? So basically I would help promote his site and he would help uh, promote my site. Now I do have to say, I think the person has a very good uh, on-screen personality. I think he's able to deliver material well. I think he can be very successful. But the last time I had checked in on his channel, it had been pretty small. I mean, like, you know, if I'm here, it's, it's here. Again, nothing against it, but we're, we're not quite playing in the same league. So I thought it was interesting that he approached me about this. You know, the high, whole idea of cross-promotion, because the way that I'm looking at it is if you're coming to me to ask to do cross-promotion, it means that you have something to offer, that it's not a one-way one way thing. So it's like, okay, if I have 300, or I don't even know what I have now, uh, however many 100,000 subscribers, you may not have that many subscribers, but you have something else. So I went over and I went to to take a look at his YouTube channel and then was a bit saddened, very, very, very saddened to find out uh, that they had not uploaded a video in three months. So it was three months since the past, the last video was uploaded. It was five months uh, since the second one was uploaded. And basically, there have been a couple of uploads over the entire past year. So the last time this person had even put out very many videos was over a year ago. So it became obvious to me that for whatever reason, right now, they're not being that serious about their YouTube channel. And so I emailed them and said, I don't quite grasp what's going on. And they gave the normal thing of, oh, I'm busy, wife, work, Again, all of those things are completely and utterly normal, but the thing that hit my head, that, that, that went through my head, though, is I don't understand why you are reaching out to me then. You obviously are, are not focused that focused on your YouTube channel. You're not putting that much effort into your YouTube channel. So why are you going to, I hate to say, one of the higher-ups, one of the successful people, seeing if you can do things like cross-promotion when it's obvious you're not even putting in the time and energy. It's kind of like, okay, you want to do cross-promotion so I can send more viewers to you, but even right now you're not willing to really create that many videos and do that much work. How does that work out? And basically what I, what I told this person is I said, listen, I have a very, 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 very snarky <laughs> fan base. And if I start advertising you right now, um, beyond, beyond whatever my personal feelings are, if I start advertising you right now, uh, my fans are going to have a, have a field day with that one. So no. So that's what, what I want you guys to be thinking about, right? Because everybody, again, everybody says you got to go out there and you got to ask for help. Well, the question is, is, are you laying the foundation so that when you go to ask for help, it doesn't look like a joke. It doesn't actually look a little insulting. And to be honest with you, that was a little insulting. I mean, you're coming to me to, to ask for help and you haven't done a video in three months and five months and a year. 
why are you coming to me? So when you're going to go out there, when you're going to start asking for help, make sure you lay the foundation. Like I say, if, you're, if you are a YouTuber, since that's what I do, that's why I can explain best right now. If you're a YouTuber, before you go out and you start pinging uh, people that are successful in this and looking for, for cross promotion and all that, make sure you're putting out two videos a week or one very high quality video a week. You know, so if you come to me or if you go to somebody else and they go back and they look at your channel, they can see you may not have a lot of subscribers, you may not have a lot of views, you may not have a lot of anything, but you do have videos, right? The one thing that you can absolutely and utterly control is how much productivity you put out. You can control how much content you create. So if I go there, you may not have the subscribers, you may not have the views, you may not have a lot of other things, things, but I can look at it and go, I can see that this person is putting a lot of effort into what they're doing, therefore I know they're serious. And so this goes beyond uh, things like uh, things like YouTube. So you're looking at it going, well, Eli, I'm not a web content creator. You know, that's a cute story, but what does it have to do with me? But it goes into to the rest of the world. It's one of the things I run into with uh, with noobs, you know, the, the technolo technology new people all the time, is they say, Eli, I can't get a job. And it's like, well, when was the last time you picked up a book and studied PHP? Oh, well, Eli, I, I don't have time for that. You know what I'm saying? You don't know how many people I have run into that way, where they do. And it's, again, it gets tiring and insulting after a while. But they'll be like, Eli, I want to have a cup of coffee with you. I want to, I want to talk to you about how I, get a, like how I get ahead and how I get a job and how I do all these things. And I'll sit there and I'll listen to their life story. And they'll put it all out and I'll go, okay, so what you need to do is a college degree or what you need to do is grab this PHP book you know I, I figure out I think about it and I give them an honest to golly customize what I believe you should do and then you don't know how many times they say oh you lie I don't I don't have the time to do that <laughs> you're like I don't, I don't know what to tell you. If you want to be a computer programmer, you got to learn programming. Oh, Eli, you don't understand. I have a kid and I have a wife and I have a job. I don't have time to learn computer programming. Okay, well then, how, how are you going to be a programmer? You, you know, I mean, you, you got to learn the material before you can do it. So that's one of the things I want you guys to be thinking about is, are you laying the foundation? So when you go and ask for help, uh, that you're, you're not written off. Because that's one of the things I really do see happen a lot, and I've had to deal with a lot, is again, people come to help. And I, I do. A lot of people. There's too many of you guys. But, you know, people that I know personally. Um, I do want to help. And I do want to help make successful. But if you come to me asking for specific advice, and then the specific advice that I give you is things you're like, well, Eli, I don't have time or whatever, then what? So there we go. Those are some final thoughts today. Make sure you are building a foundation for when you go out to ask for help. Because what I see time and time and time again in the real world is people just go out and they ask for help and they think people like me can wave a freaking magic wand and, and make success happen. And that's not, again, like I say with this guy, I could send a million visitors to his YouTube channel. But the fact of the matter is, if he's not putting out content regularly, they're going to go and leave and that's it. Won't do any good.